Heavenly Father, God, we just ask you to come and fill us with your Spirit, even now, Lord, that we would understand that which is written, this example that is given. Lord, we know that everything that has been placed in your Word, especially in these books that would be considered historical, these books that would, would be the, the chronology of, of Israel and your people, Lord, and the things that you brought them through, we know that this is for us to learn from. And so, Lord, may it be that we would learn not only individually, but that we would learn to make application within our families, and, Lord, even within our, our cities, our towns, our states, and even the nation and the world around us. So we thank you, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chapter 20, 2 Chronicles, it says, It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, that they are in Hazron Tamar, which is in in Gedi. As we pick this up in the narrative of Jehoshaphat, what we're going to see now is we're going to see other countries now coming against the southern kingdom of Judah. <coughs> the nations have aligned themselves against Judah, the countries of Moab, Ammon, and the other one's not mentioned in here, but it would have been the Edomites that would have been involved in this process. And word comes to Jehoshaphat that they have crossed the Dead Sea, and they're in the area and the region of En Gedi. Now, En Gedi is a really, really cool place in the middle of a not-so-cool cool wilderness. En Gedi is an oasis that is that is set between the Dead Sea and the, the mountains in which David took and spent much time running away from Saul. This was the area of the stronghold. It was the area, and we'll see, and we have seen that many times it was, it was referred to as David would retreat to En Gedi. And hopefully within a few weeks, because I've decided that we're going to wait till the girls get home in a couple of weeks to do the presentation on our, on our visit to Israel, because I want to have them here and be able to share the things that they learned as well. And plus, they've got a bunch more pictures that I don't have. So we're going we're gonna to incorporate their, uh, their opportunity to share too. And they spent an, 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 an afternoon in En Gedi, and I've got some beautiful pictures with waterfalls and oasis. So this is the area where they came, and it makes sense as they would have come across the Dead Sea, they had to find a place for fresh water. And so they went into En Gedi. And what's even more interesting, though, as we start looking at the battle that's about to take place then, is that there is another battle that is very much so likened to it, almost a repeat of history that's going to take place in the future. In Ezekiel, in chapter 38, it talks about another confederate, confederacy of nations that come together against Israel. And we're going to see within that, that narrative that, that many of these Islamic nations that surround Israel even today, nations such as Syria and, and Iran and Saudi Arabia and some of the Baltic and European states, and especially, well, not so much that it's a Muslim country, but one that is a great threat is going to be Russia. And it's going to take place in this same area. There's going to be the same outcome that we're going to see here that's going to take place in the end days as God here takes care of and protects Israel in a supernatural way. He will continue to do that well into the future. And in the end times, close to the end, He's going to do it again. And so this is a place where much is going to happen, not only in this time, but in time to come. And Jehoshaphat feared and he set himself to seek the Lord. I want you to underline that. Because that is the, the secret of successfully overcoming fear. Jehoshaphat feared, and he set himself to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judea, or Judah, and Judah gathered together to ask for help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all of the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it and they built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, 
by sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this temple in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. I'm always excited when we see these examples within Scripture that when the people faced calamity, when the people faced hardship, when there was uncertainty, that godly leaders, one of the first things that they do without hesitation is they remind the people of who God is and what He has done. And I think that this is a great pattern, not only for for nations, but it's a great pattern for us as a family, as individuals, to remember what it is that God has done when we face hardship. But he goes even farther because he says that regardless of what happens, we're going to remain faithful. This place has been dedicated to your worship. We are going to come and we are going to praise. Even in the midst of our affliction, we're going to cry out to you. Because we know you've done it before, you'll do it again. And when it really comes down to it, when we, when we think about how it is that, that, that God operates within our lives, we know that there's not any time in our lives that God has not been faithful, but yet how often do we approach calamity in such a way that we think that maybe this time He won't be? So often it's the place of hardship and, and difficulty where people lose their faith it's always said when i talk to somebody that's experienced calamity or even tragedy and it has become the reason for them to walk away from god very often when we can't understand why something happens we have a tendency to trust god or or to to question god's purpose and his provision for us in our lives and it happens i've had people just flat out tell me god let me down I can't believe that this happened or that that happened. And it can be something that's tragic. It could be a diagnosis. It can be the loss of a loved one, of a child. I mean, some of the hardest things that I've ever had to do in my entire life in relationship to ministering to people is to try to help them through the loss of a child. There's not a parent ever, I don't think, that's ever been born that, that thinks that it's okay to have to bury a child. Just not supposed to be that way. But yet, in the midst of it, It's that time when we wind up taking and we wind up questioning how it is that God's purpose and His provision is able to work. And it's understandable within our heart. There's there's no reason not to accept and embrace that it's okay to have those feelings of why God is this happening to me now? Why are you allowing this to take place? It's part of our nature. It's part of our humanness as we would look at how things are happening around us and question. The problem is, though, that We have to accept that God cannot be judged based on the circumstances of life. (laughs) I mean, again, we looked just recently a little bit into the life of Job. right? And we talked about how it was that Job lost everything. And he did nothing wrong. I mean, what what a perfect example. If there's ever any place within Scripture that we want to understand that we can do everything right and everything can go wrong, no better place than Job. He said, naked I came in, naked I'm going out. And then there was a, there was a questioning by which he, he, he made a definitive statement. He said, am I in a position, should I only be that one that would accept good from God and not accept bad things that He would allow? How is it that I can take and receive His blessings, but at the same time when things are against me, not continue to sing His praises? And he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We sing the song. And we'll throw it up on a screen and we'll sing with all the gusto in the world. And, 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 we, and we, we want to believe it. <laughs> we want to live it. Regardless, when the sun's shining or when I'm walking through the valley, when things are hard or when things are good, blessed be the name of the Lord. And this is really what, what Jehoshaphat is declaring He's declaring that, declaring that in the midst of this affliction, regardless of what happens, they've come to worship God. They're standing in the temple, and that's what they're going to do. But see, one of the other things that we have to look at is we have to understand that some of the greatest moves, some of the greatest influences of God that has come into human history, into, into mankind, happen because of hardship and tragedy. Very often, in order to move the heart of man into the direction of a loving God, the heart of man, the the worldly heart, has to be broken. 
There has to be this, this, this willingness to take and to, to allow affliction and adversity to come into our lives in order for us to really turn to the Lord. But God is amazing. And He's always willing to provide us with the comfort and the strength that we need in the hardest times. But we have to remember that if we're going to keep our faith from failing, if we're going to take and keep our eyes focused on the things of the Lord, we have to do what Jehoshaphat is doing here. I think that this is, this is a great pattern for overcoming calamity and tragedy and fear. First, he brings all the people together. <laughs> God's people come together. There's safety in numbers. There's strength in numbers. This is a place where as we come in here, we draw strength and we gain strength and we, we gain the ability to be able to endure based on the fact that we are in, in company with like-minded brothers and sisters who are also relying and trusting in the Lord. This is one of the reasons why it's so important that we stay committed to a body. It's one of the reasons why it's so important that we come into fellowship because there's so many that will seek to come into a place of fellowship, come into the church when things have gotten so bad and they've been so disconnected for so long. And understand, I love it when people come back to church. I love it when you see that person that, that, that either hasn't been to church for a long time and it's like, man, my life is really messed up right now. And so I thought, I need to come to church. And so I'm here to really seek the Lord because when, my, when, when I was seeking the Lord, my life went well and then I got away from the Lord and I've been walking in and now I'm back. And I always want to go, why are you back? Are you back because you really want to seek the Lord based on who He is, or are you here because you just need to feel better about your life? Are you just looking for some relief? Are you just looking for, for things to get a little bit better, and as soon as things get better, you're out the door again. And guys, it happens all the time. I mean, we see that happen. It isn't that I'm never going to tell somebody at the door, you can't come in because I know you don't mean it. But there's times, there's times when I almost feel like, are you, really, are you really doing this for the right reasons? Are you going to stay focused on the things of God even if your life doesn't get better? Even if your circumstances don't change? Now understand, we all, every single one of us has come to the Lord based on the fact that we couldn't do it anymore. Calamity, hardship, tragedy, you name it. There's that breaking, there's that end of us to where we come to the Lord based on the fact that we have to have some relief. So I get that. But so often what happens is, is if we've not been in fellowship and it becomes this process by which, by which we just run back and forth into the house of the Lord or into the people of the Lord to gain strength so that we can go out and continue to do that which we were doing before, we lose all benefit of fellowship. There's all benefit lost. Now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. And here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do but our eyes are upon you. Another great place to underline. We don't know what to do, but we're going to keep an eye on God. We're going to keep looking to Him. I don't know what to do with this situation. What do you do when you don't know what to do? I mean, what, what, what do you do? I mean, come on. Be honest about it. What do, what do we as people do when we don't know what to do? Go to the Internet. <laughs> yeah, we go to the all-knowing Internet, right? We, we, we go to the internet. We go to friends. We start playing the what if game. How many of you besides me played a what if game? The worst case scenario game. Right? Well, what's the worst case scenario? Because it's almost as if we can determine what the worst case is, then we can figure out how to get over anything less than the worst case. And if we accept and we embrace the fact that there could be a worst case scenario, you know what I found though? It could always get worse. <laughs> Just about the time you think it can't get any worse, guess what happens? It gets worse. It's like, wow, I didn't see this coming. But we have a tendency when, when these things go on in our life, when we get to the point to where we don't know what to do, and this is why I love that saying that came out of the final few months of Pastor Chuck's life when he said, never give up what you know for what you don't know. 
Never give up. If you don't know what to do, keep doing what you know what to do while you're waiting for God to show you what else to do. I mean, that's really what it is. But so often what happens is if we don't know what to do, we wind up becoming paralyzed. We wind up becoming those that do nothing. And in the process of doing nothing, so often failures on on the horizon. There's fear that rises. There's going to be times when the answer doesn't come. There's going to be times when there's just no answer. It's not going to be anywhere to be found. Now, it could also be a matter of the fact that there's just no option. There's no answer because there's no option. There's no way out of it. There's no way to to make it better. There's no way to make it. It just is what it is. Oh, but then there's other times. Have you ever been confronted with too many options? There were too many options that you could take. There were too many ways that you could go. And because you could go so many different ways, not all of them being bad, not all of them being good, there wasn't a clear direction on which one you should and which one you should. There's five different ways I could go, and all of them look okay. So I'm not going to do nothing. So I'm just going to wait. In times like that, all we can do is look and trust in the Lord and the promises that He's given us. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But let's see what it says in verse 13. It says, And now all of Judah, with their little ones, their wives, their children, they stood before the Lord. I like that. Everybody got involved. The little ones. There is a tendency in our culture to go one of two directions, I think, that can be either one harmful. The one is to completely insulate our kids from absolutely anything that is that is reality and then on the other side there is let's expose them to everything as if somehow or another that's going to help them to mature and grow into good people right when it comes to the things of the lord i think that it's very important and i think that it's something that needs to be done especially without exception in Christian families as we are praying for and asking for the intervention of God or looking to God's word for answers in, in, in problems that arise in our lives that we bring into that equation our children. Now in Stephanie and I's life as we were raising the kids there were a few things that we figured they didn't need to worry about. They didn't need to worry about where the money was coming from. They didn't need to worry about how the bills were getting paid. They didn't need to worry about the nuts and bolts and how the air, you know, the, the heat stayed on and, 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 and how they, they didn't worry about that. We didn't turn the heat on. But yeah, basically we just didn't run any heat. <laughs> or air, as I recall. That was why I was glad I went to work, because I had both in my office. But there were certain things from a parental standpoint that were the provision, were the things that we carried that they didn't need to know about. And there were some, sometimes when I would talk to, to, to kids and I, would, and, I, and I would see how it is that their parents were literally bringing them into all of the worries of life. It's like, stop. But let me tell you what. We also need to be, on the other hand of that, making sure that when we are relying on God, that they see us in prayer, they join us in prayer, They know that we are seeking and receiving our wisdom from the things of the Lord and from His Word and standing upon His promises because if they don't see that, they won't learn how to do that for themselves. And it's one of the reasons that we see children failing as they grow up and they get into adulthood. Mom and dad went to church and they had faith and they drug me to church every Sunday and I went to the Sunday school things. But you know what? I never never put the connection together. I never realized how much they were relying on God because they never said anything about it. I didn't see any miracles in our family. And yet if you ask the parents, it's like, oh man, God was all over this place, man. There were times when this happened and this happened and this happened. They don't remember, but there was a time when they were sick and if it wouldn't have been for this, that they would have died. And if it would... And it's not shared. And so I think it's a great example when we see that one of the things that Jehovah's Sophat did is he said, bring them all. We're going to pray. We're going to gather together. We're going to praise the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jezeel, the son of Zechariah. And he said to them, and it says obviously that he was a Levite and all those other names that I'm not going to butcher. He said, listen, all of you, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat. So he gets everybody's attention. Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you'll find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeril. 
You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. What an amazing promise. I mean, what an, what an amazing promise given to, to Israel. The battle is not yours, but it's God. And you see, guys, the battle against evil in this world belongs to the Lord. Our part, I think, is very, very much so like it was for Israel. We're supposed to stand strong and rely on the Lord. We're not supposed to be dismayed. We're not supposed to be fearful. We're supposed to rely on the promises of God. And one of the greatest means by which we dispel fear, one of the greatest ways that we are able to take and, and, and not have fear overcome us is through the practice of recognizing the presence of God in our lives. When fear is growing in the absence of God, it can become overwhelming. It can become that which causes us to cower. It causes us to fall away. And yet... When fear is in the presence of God, it has absolutely no power over us. If we're in the habit of practicing the presence of God and recognizing that He's there, fear, when it comes, well, it'll come and stand right alongside God. And fear in the presence of God is no enemy. Just uh, recently, as you guys know, while we were over in Israel, it was great. The kids and Stephanie and I found ourselves in all kinds of new situations, Right? All kinds of new and unfamiliar situations. All kinds of new, unfamiliar, and even at times dangerous situations. I mean, you can't be in a country that has all the things going on that the Middle East and Israel has going on, walking on the streets where every third person has got an M16 slung over their shoulder, and think, oh gee, they're just carrying this for decoration. There's the potential for things, and as we were there, and even since then, there have been things that have happened that have caused us to go, wow. This is real. The struggle is real. The battle is real. And as we were walking through unfamiliar territory, I mean, it was really kind of funny because the girls, you know, had, have a tendency to walk faster than Stephanie and I do, right? Well, let's put it this way. If Stephanie's walking with me, they walk faster because I walk slower than all of them, all right? They had this airport stroll that would work, you know, it's almost likened to O.J. Simpson commercials 100 years ago when he ran through the airport, you know? But I'm walking with Stephanie, and we're strolling, and they're on a mission. And so we're watching them, and they're 10, 15 yards ahead of us. And they look fearless. And we even commented from time to time, look at them. I can't believe it. They're just like walking into these alleyways, and they're walking into these shops, and they're walking through these unfamiliar places and all these things. And, and they're just acting. I mean, they just seem fearless. And it wasn't that they were fearless. It's every time they looked back, they saw Dad behind them. Dad was there bringing up the rear, and I'm watching for everything that's going on around me. And so they were able to be confident in the face of whatever fears that they might have in the uncomfortableness and the awkwardness and the unfamiliar sur surroundings and territory because Dad had their back. Now, Dad is continually looking around and making sure that somebody's got my back. <laughs> huh? Because every time they looked at me, I had to act like I knew what I was doing. I might have this look of sheer terror on my face and the kids turn around and look back and it's like they turn around and it's like but that's the presence of God how often do we find ourselves collapsing under fear and then we come into the understanding oh but God oh I can turn to God oh that's right I'm afraid so now I can turn guys God's there all the time. And as we practice the presence of God in our life, everywhere we go, every step we take, every move we make, we're going to recognize that we don't need to have this spirit of fear. We don't have to allow fear to creep into our lives because God is right there at every single step. And this is exactly what we see happening with Israel as they start moving into this situation. This is this aspect of understanding that God is right with them. They don't need to be afraid. They don't need to be dismayed. Verse 18, it says, And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Ju Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohite, Kohathites and the children of the Kohites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And they went out 
Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and the habits of, of inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he has consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. And they were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. I love this picture. The army is all dressed. The army's ready to go to battle. They're going to go out into battle. But there's a choir leading the army. Jehoshaphat assigns. And you'll remember when we, when we look back into, into to the time of David and we look back at the preparation that was done for the, the temple, you remember there was a whole group of Levites, there was a whole group of, of musicians that were prepared just for the purposes night and day to sing praises unto the Lord. All right, full-time choir members. It was their job. So instead of sending out the biggest, baddest of the military, they put out in front of the army the choir. I kind of see some kind of like spiritual thing going on. You know what I mean? <laughs> Tambourines and dancing and, 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 and saying, praising at the top of their lungs, singing as they go out into battle. Now the interesting thing about this is, is that, that it isn't a matter of them hoping for victory. It's not a matter of them psyching themselves up. You know, it's, this isn't one of those things where they're in the locker room banging their heads against the locker and going, ah, 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 ah. They're claiming that the victory is already won before the battle even begins. Why? Because God has promised it. And guys, understand that for the Christian, the joy and the victory that we have happens before the outcome. We don't have to wait on the outcome to see if God came through. We don't have to wait on the outcome to think somehow or another that, that, that God is going to show up and do what it is that He says and that He's promised that He's going to do. If He has promised He's going to do it, then the promise is true. I think more often, though, that we have a tendency to wait to praise Him to see if He does it our way. You know how that works? I mean, we know that God can't lose. <laughs> We know that God has never lost. We know that He has never not followed through on a promise. We know this in our knower. We don't necessarily know it in our, in our actions as we live it out. We have to experience that in order to be able to take and to stand on it. But the, the reality is, is that God is not going to fail, but yet failure comes, I believe, because He doesn't do it our way. Man, I prayed and I told God, this is what I needed and He didn't bring it. He didn't do his job. We have to understand that we, <laughs> we can never think that somehow or another that God failed just because he doesn't do it our way. As a matter of fact, it's more of a success if he doesn't do it our way because our ways are normally very short-sighted and self-serving. They're not what is best. They're what is most expedient to relieve the pressure or the stress or the pain that we're under at that particular instant or moment. And we very seldom look past what is an instant fix. But the failure is not trusting God regardless of if He meets our desired outcome or not. But look at what happens in verse 22. Now when they began to praise... They began to sing and praise. The Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah and they were defeated. I love this. What happens here is that the people start praising the Lord before they know what He's going to do. He promised, I got this. So they start praising Him. They don't have to wait to see the hand of the Lord move. But as they start praising, it does. And understand, again, they didn't know what God was going to do. They didn't know by what means He was going to provide victory, but they had faith and they had, had trust in the word that He had spoken to them, and they began to praise Him based on the promise, not the outcome. They praised Him based on the promise, not the outcome. I think it's interesting. Sometimes we think that maybe things were different back in the day. You know the day. Back in the time of Israel, back in the time of the prophets. The days when ancient Israel was spoken to 
by the prophets. And how cool would it have been? I mean, think about it for a minute. If you're facing a calamity, if you're facing some sort of tragedy, if you need an answer and there's, there's something coming against you, to have somebody come in with apostolic or with, with prophetic credential and say, Thus says the Lord, fear not. He's going to handle this for you. Everybody be like, whoop, whoop. <laughs> Here we go. We don't have to worry about it because we have God's word on it given to us by the prophet. God's man. Now see, the problem is, I don't think it was really any easier on them. I don't believe that when, when we look back, we think that, oh, how much better must it have been when there was a prophet that would come on the scene and make a declaration based on what God's word was to the people in order for them to be able to follow. Because you've got to think about it for a minute. The king got the word. A few people got the word, but the masses didn't get the word. So the king's like, okay, we got God's word on this. We're going to go move this way. Pass it down the line. God told us he's got this. By the time it gets to the end of the line, it's a duck swims at midnight. I mean, you know how it works? So here's the people not having access to the very word of God that we as God's people have today. Guess what? They had God's word on it. So do we. We've got God's word on it. But so often we have a tendency to fail because we think somehow or another that the answers aren't here, that they have to come under some or other type of means. But guys, we need to understand that we're not looking for prophecy in relationship to our lives now because the prophecies have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 1, verse 1, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in the past to the fathers by the prophet, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things through Him, who also He made the world, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and the upholding of all things by the word of His power, that when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. See, in the old times, God spoke to his people through the prophets. But in this time, God has spoken concerning every need that we have in our life. And he's spoken it through his son, Jesus Christ. The promise is fulfilled. We have God's word on it. And the Word of God has come to each and every one of us, and it is completely fulfilled in Jesus. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Listen, as His divine power has given to us all things. How many? How many is all? I mean, that's, that's more than most, right? has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So, this knowledge of Jesus Christ provides to us everything, all things that pertain to life and godliness. What do we struggle with? Life and godliness. I mean, isn't that, isn't that the main focus of our struggle all right but here's what it says and this is what's so important we have this aspect of all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these listen you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. His divine power has given us all that we need to negotiate this life regardless and to live it in a godly fashion. But it has to happen through the knowledge of Him. It has to happen through the knowledge of Him. So what is it that we lack I mean, tonight if you're here and you're thinking, I've got these problems and I'm afraid of this happening or I have fear about this going on or I have... What do you lack? 
I mean, is there anything that is lacking? Is there anything that is, that, is, that is between you and the victory that God has already promised? And if it is, the only thing that it can be is a lack of knowledge. That's what it says. That in Him, in the knowledge of Him, we have all that we need for life and for godliness. So if we don't have what we need right at the moment, what are we lacking? Oh, well, God's just got to show up and He's just got to do this supernaturally because if He doesn't show up, then I don't know what's going to happen. Well, He's going to show up, but He's probably already shown up in His Word. The knowledge of Him, the power that pertains to all things in life is the knowledge that we have in Christ. But so often we wind up waiting for the answer in a direction from the Lord that at times has already been clearly delineated, clearly given, clearly defined in His Word. There's times when I'm waiting on the Lord and I think that I'm exercising great spiritual muscle. I'm so proud of myself because I'm waiting on the Lord. And I'm waiting on an answer. And then I read something or I listen to a commentary or I I come across something and I go, there it is! And I think, oh Lord, thank you so much for revealing that. And he says, and I revealed that to you guys 2,000 years ago! Just been waiting on you to read it. Now I'm not taking out the power of the Spirit working on our life and leading and guiding and directing us and bringing us a word through another brother or sister. Another reason why fellowship is so important. Sharpening of iron. Iron sharpening iron. But the fact of the matter is is everything we need is right here. And yet, we're afraid. You want to have less fear? Read your Bible more. It's a prescription. It works. Because God will answer the questions that you have because they're already here. It's just a lack of knowledge of Him that we know now. Do we still need to seek through the Spirit? Do we still need to pray in the Spirit? Do we still need? Yes. But that's facilitated by His Word. I think that there are times when God, because He's already given us His Word on it, He doesn't tell us by other means. Isn't it amazing? I mean, you guys know how this works. When you really get serious about studying the Word of God and you're reading His Word every single day, isn't it amazing how the answers come? You read it on Monday and here you are using it on Tuesday? Or you read it last week and here it is that you are faced with a calamity in the life of somebody else and all of a sudden the Spirit is able to reach in and just bring that out of you and bring it to life in their life? At the same time, you've been in that situation where you didn't have anything. I got nothing. I'm standing here thinking, okay, what am I going to do in this situation? It's because the tank is empty. I have no reserve. I have nothing to draw from. I have nothing. I have no knowledge banked up. And guys, understand, again, this is part of our human condition. It's one of the reasons we come to church. It's one of the reasons you guys are here and you're listening to me expand the Word of God is because you want to learn, and this is great, and this is the environment in which that happens. It's also why it's really easy and there's nothing wrong with it that you would go to an elder or you would go to the pastor when you have a question or when you have a concern. And the the reason is not that we are more spiritual. We don't have a better pipeline to God. Most of the time, you know what the difference is? I've read more of the Bible than you have. I spend more time in study than you have. Now, it's not a condemnation. I'm just telling you the answers are there for you. You don't have to use me. You're welcome to. But that's why we go to that seasoned saint. That's why we go to that individual that has been been years investing in in their lives and we see the the evidence of that coming out of their lives. It's because when you see someone that is invested in and somebody that is pouring into and and is, and is, is, is immersed in the Word of God, their lives are different. It's not that, oh man, you are so, wow, that's a great answer, great answer. It's not my answer. It's God's answer. I just happened across it. I came across it. And that's why it's so important that we don't fail because of a lack of knowledge. When we have the knowledge of Jesus Christ, we go from being afraid and dismayed to having an attitude of confidence and victory. It's that simple. For the people of Ammon, verse 23 And Moab stood against the inhabitants of Mount Seir and utterly killed them and destroyed them. And then they made an end of the inhabitants of Seir. They helped destroy one another 
So when Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness, they looked towards the multitude, and there it was, it was nothing but dead bodies falling on the earth. No one had escaped. Guys, we have to understand that the enemies of God end up fighting against themselves and destroying each other. We think sometimes that there's such a great orchestrated and, and coordinated and unified move on the other side right? That we think that somehow or another that, that there's, there's a unified side of good and a unified side of evil, and they're clashing together, and there's all of this coordination. There is no coordination at all. All you do is look at the political conundrum we're in, and you can recognize that there is no coordination between the other side and this side and that side and them side and these folks and those folks and anybody else. Everybody's out for who? Themselves. It's not coordinated. How easy is it to take those that are, that are talking about tolerance and turn them into a hateful mob that's pillaging and, ra and, and raping and, and tearing down glass and, 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 and crashing things and looting and everything? I mean, wow. Organized, right? No. When Jehoshaphat and the people came to take the spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables, valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry. And when they stripped off for themselves they had more than they could carry away they were there three days gathering the spoil there was so much and on the fourth day they assembled in the valley of barak for there was for there they blessed the lord therefore they named this place and they called it the valley of block barak until this day and that means the valley of blessing then they returned every man of judah and jerusalem with jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to jerusalem with joy for the lord they had made to rejoice over their enemies so they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and with trumpets to the house of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord came upon all of the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for God gave him rest all around. So Jehoshaphat was king over Judah. He was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother was named Azubah, the daughter of Shilhai. And he walked in the way of his father Asa. And he did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, indeed are written in the book of Jehu, the son of Hananiah, which is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel. After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, aligned himself with Azahiah, the king of Israel, who acted very wickedly. And he applied or allied himself to him to make ships to go to Tarsus. And they made ships in Ezia and Geber. And Eliezer, the son of Dovana, of Marsha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have allied yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your works. Then the ships were wrecked so that they were not able to go to Tarshish. I often wonder why it is that in Scripture there's an opportunity to have this great act of godly achievement followed by a historic blunder. I mean, Jehoshaphat called the people together. They had this great time of, 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 of unity. God moved in their, in their hearts because they, and in their lives, and they destroyed their enemies because they kept their eyes on Him, and they praised Him, and they worshipped Him in the worst of times. And all of a sudden, right at the end of the process, and we're going to see this is right before Jehoshaphat dies. He goes to the north, and he hooks up with a wicked king and goes into the shipbuilding business. And it fails miserably. I think I know why this happens. I think God wants to show us that they're just men. They're just people. Because I think if all we saw was the tremendous spiritual leadership, the calling together of the people, the, the, the praising of the Lord, the words of, 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 of adoration and of worship and of praise that, that He threw out, if that's all we saw, we would think that somehow or another that we could never do that because we don't have that kind of strength. And so over and over and over again, we see within Scripture where God takes and demonstrates to us that who He uses is folks just like us. So yes, are we capable of absolutely great and phenomenal 
acts of great righteousness and, and worship before the Lord? Absolutely. Followed <laughs> by terrible blunders from time to time. And it can happen. Fear is overcome by praise. That's the key. We can praise Him because we've got His Word on it. We don't have to wait for a word. The Word has been given. It's been spoken. It's been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's worship. Heavenly Father God, we just thank You. And Lord, we come before You just asking that You would open up our hearts and our minds to receive that which You have for us. And that, Lord, we would stand on those promises. Lord, You've already given us Your Word. We don't have to wait for a word. We don't have to wait for you to, you to come and tell us, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. I'm in control. I've got this covered because, Lord, you have already given us your word that victory is ours through your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, may it be that we would walk in that victory, that we would help others to see how it is that they, too, by knowing you, praising you, worshiping you, receiving you, can also walk in victory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.